I'm in the making toss fruit at people. <laughs> Someone comes by, he's like, you know, he's always giving out the free samples of, you know, the ones that are just a few days old. They're not bad yet, but he can't sell them for very much. So he's tossing them to people. You know, he sees people, he's like, say, hey, there's your apple. Um, and then, you know, he, he goes over and talks to them and they start talking. And he's like, oh, there's a tidbit in there. And he rhymes it in his head to memorize it for later on that night so he can write it down. We've got a character there, don't we? Just in that viewpoint where we can start doing this. I wouldn't even reveal he's a spy until halfway through the scene, maybe even to that evening, where he writes them all down and then puts them in the letter that he mails to the person who's paying for him as a patron and says, I thought you might be interested in these things. You never have to mention the word spy in this entire scene, and we will get it, and it will be more fascinating that way, because he maybe doesn't even think of himself as a spy. He just gathers interesting information and sends it to the king of the opposing country because, you know, his aunt lives there or something, you know. Or the, the king gets him fruit at a discount. So he doesn't even take money. So he's not really a spy. He's not a traitor. He just has good mercantile instincts. Okay? All right. How are we going to... Let, let's come up with a plot hook for, um, for our fruit-tossing um, spy vendor. He throws the fruit in order to get a guy to catch the fruit. Uh -huh. And the guy's coat comes open and he sees a scroll. Okay, okay, that could be, that's, that's a, okay, that's, that's like more of an event than a plot hook, but that is a good one. I'm looking for more just general things that you can do um, that, um, yeah, like how we can describe some of these things you do that, that establish a plot that is already ongoing. He hits the girl with a piece of fruit on accident. What's that? He hits the girl with a piece of fruit on accident. Okay, he hits the gesture with a piece of fruit, okay. Okay. Hit someone else. He hits one of these people with his piece of fruit. Well, what else can we do to evoke a, a plot for this guy? His employer is looking for a spy from the other side, and he's trying to find out who is talking to whom to find that spy. Okay, he's looking to find that spy. We would need to have some sort of little hook on this person. He notices a gesture of looking for a mark. Yeah, I would say, let's say it's um, something more along the line. He, he knows the spy has four fingers on one hand, <laughs> and so is tossing the fruit to see who catches it to see if he can find the four-fingered person. Does this make sense? We design our scene so that what he's doing works into his established plot already. Here's something to keep or in mind. With a glass eye, so he throws it so that it's Oh, glass there you go, glass eye. Glass eye is great. <laughs> he's looking for the glass-eyed man. Um, what I'm doing here, and, and what, why, why the reason, one of the reasons I'm making this distinction is um, a lot of people, new writers, start a story and are going to assume that the story then starts then. But for the characters, their story has been going as long as they're alive. And if you introduce people who are not already involved in things going on, it's going to feel fake. And it should feel fake because we all have drama going on in our lives right now. We all have plots going on in our lives. And if you start your story and nothing has ever happened to this person and then stuff does, or if it feels like that, you don't have a real world, a real character. Everyone in you open a scene, they should be in the, generally, you should establish in the first paragraph what they want, what they're doing, and that sort of thing in just one line. Because people don't generally, you know, they always are wanting something. Even if it's just to sit, sit and be left alone like Bilbo um, or Frodo want to be left alone, particularly Bilbo. They, you establish that they want something. People, too many um, opening parts from, um, from new writers, someone just wandering along with no desires or wishes until something bad happens and then they get chased by monsters for the rest of the book. Reluctant hero. Yeah, that is the reluctant hero, but they should have stuff going on in their life to make them feel real, all right? Keep that in mind. So that's why I like the he's searching for a spy. Now something may happen. He maybe hits the, um, you know, he sees that a, a scroll. That he's like, oh, I've been told to watch for those. And that starts the, the longer plot hook for the book. Or he hits the jester with the piece of fruit. And she gets really mad and sends assassins after him because she just snaps. He's like, this is enough for me. Um, you know, my boyfriend and the assassin yelled that I didn't want to know I'm a jester. Well, I'm just going to go to him and have him take out this fruit merchant. Um, you know, I, I'm go, I've gone snapped, and then I'm going to kill the 12-year-old kill the princess, and, you know, life is going to go crazy from here. That can, that can establish your flight and have these things happen. But, but people live outside of your stories. At least you want the reader to feel that they live, have lives outside of your stories. All right? All right. I'm not going to do the other two. Um, I think we established what I'm trying to do here with these two. Um, but, you know, 
this is a, a good exercise for you to do to practice how people see the world. It is possible to go too overboard on some of these things, but most people don't do enough of it. Most people don't go overboard. Um, if you've got an artist, have them notice art and color more than someone else. If you've got a character who's a musician, have them notice sounds. It will wonderfully help us um, evoke this character. These are the things you need to do. So that's, that's kind of, well, that's not kind of, that's the lecture portion of this. We're going to go to, to Q and A where we can talk about specifics for a little while. But um, hopefully that kind of starts to establish a lot of readers like, why do they reject stories so quickly? Maybe this helps you. All right. All right. What do you want to know? What are your questions? Got a quick question. Maybe build on this in mm -hmm. real life for you. I kind of got introduced to you from mm -hmm. obviously taking over the, uh, the Wheel of Time and then have read The Mistborn. And, right. Uh, Warbreaker and, and Alcatraz, um, and it seems that so many of your characters have such a a, a, a great sense of humor okay, and yeah. wit. Well, um, I'm glad you came and, back. Well, I mean, <laughs> it, it, truly so. But then you look at the Gathering Storm, and yeah. wow, there's almost none of that. Yeah. You know, anything that was that in those characters, how difficult is that for you? Because that seems like a, a maybe something you're drawing from yourself or comfort level to put that into characters to draw us in, um, how hard is that to switch that kind of characterization? You, um, you as, a, as a professional, when you become a writer, um, you learn to use different tools and the right tool in the right place. Um, it was not hard at all, is the answer to you. I did not go into it writing this and say, oh, I, I need to make this more funny. Um, that wasn't the book I was writing at that point. Um, and you will learn this as you, as you write to write different tones for different books, different styles for different books. Um, Warbreaker is particularly funny. Mistborn 3 isn't particularly funny. Um, it's, it's a little bit funny, but not pr particularly. Um, but different stories for different books. Um, so I would say it was actually particularly hard. Um, I mean, the hardest thing about um, Wheel of Time writing it was getting this sort of thing right for the characters, um, because they already were so well drawn and so distinctive. Um, and so making sure Avienda feels like Avienda, I've mentioned before she was the hardest character to get right, but that, that's because um, Robert Jordan's um, viewpoint um, for her was one of the most distinctive. And so getting it to feel right for her was tough. Um, but doing, uh, doing the humor was not, I, I didn't go into it saying I want to do more. I love drama too. And there was plenty of drama to be had in Gathering Storm. So every, every book is, you know, you notice this with painters. Um, if, you, if you watch any painters or any, um, any, any visual artists, or if you are one, you notice that the pros, how easy it is for them to switch styles and do something different that completely blows your mind. Like if you ever see Gary Larson, Larson from Farsight do a, um, a detailed um, sketch of something just like, you know, that's, that's, photo, that's realistic, you're like, wow, you really can do that. <laughs> wow. It kind of blows your mind when you see things like that or when you see you know, a painting by an impressionist that they did in, in realistic or things like this. Some but Dolly. What's that? Some yeah, Dolly. yeah. when you see one of Dolly's or... Um, it's early stuff versus yeah. bizarre stuff. Or, um, or Picasso. And Picasso had lots of realistic paintings. He could do it. But he chose a, a distinct style and said, that is him. When I, shoot, when I write a book series, I choose a style. <laughs> Um, some part of it's organic, part of it's conscious, and I say this is going to be the style for this book. I'm going to write this book as a piece of art that follows this style. Um, and with Gathering Storm, it was a piece of art of a different style, um, a subtly different style than some of the ones I'd done before, um, and that was exciting to me. Can you talk a little bit about point of view and tense, and how you combine the two to? create certain, I guess, atmospheres in a story or a novel? Okay. Um, I think that's yeah. just, if you, we looked at them separately. Right. Um, the combining them is not really as, as hard as, as you would think. Um, basically, um, the biggest trouble, the biggest difficulty is going to be combining first person with these. Um, are, uh, w but that's not even a tense, that's a, is that what, no. Well, I mean, well, I'm talking about like, Okay, you read um, Cory Doctorow's Little right. Brother, uh -huh. and it's first person, present tense. Right. Um, whereas I think Twilight, I think I haven't read Twilight, so I read a little bit, but I can't remember third, third if it past. was first person, past tense. Is it first past? It's first past, isn't it? I don't know. It's so hard, that's because present and past are so, 
They blend so well. Um, yeah. It's there's really no. Well, like, remember, present and past will work exactly the same way in the reader's mind in most cases. Well, I recently read um, Pattern Recognition by mm -hmm. William Gibson, okay. which if you haven't read it, it's mm -hmm. the, the way he plays with tense was what interested me okay. in this, in this yeah. whole topic because he writes it in third person, present tense, uh -huh. uh, limited third. But then all of his flashbacks, they're also in present tense except for the critical flashback which he tells in future. Okay. Um, third person. It, it's just, yeah. I just wanted Gibson to does to weird hear. stuff. Um. <laughs> How you felt about? How do I feel about that? This, well, I mean, um, you know, how you. If you have a jarring change from um, from present to past, it will change things in a way that makes the present feel a little more immediate, um, and that jarring can make. But it's the it's the juxtaposition that works, not just it being one or the other. If that makes sense, the further readers read and the more they get pulled in, the less they will pay attention to this to tense. Um, and even first person and third limited will start to blend in your mind to the point that you will have trouble sometimes remembering which books were third limited and for, which were first person. It's um, in the moment those two can do different things, but you know, it's, it's the juxtaposition. And you're going to have to just experiment with that yourself. I can't tell you what they do because I ha I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just not enough of, um, I haven't played with it myself enough. Uh, read Gibson's work, read uh, Speed of Dark, look at them and see what it's doing and see if that's something you want to emulate or if you want to use. Um, I can't tell you really what it's going to do. Um, what it's going to, you know, the jarring effect will be, it will, number one, the reader will probably notice it and it will kick them out of the story a little bit, which is the reason that you don't normally want to do it, but if it achieves an artistic effect that you're looking for, um, then it can be useful. I, I can't really give you a good answer on that one. Um, ask, ask William Gibson. He's very personable. He likes, um, he li he likes fans. He'll give you an answer. Uh, well, like this whole talk has been like about writing the first page. Yeah. But uh, with like a prologue, mm -hmm. do you... Oh boy, uh, prologue. How does that come in? Let's talk about <laughs> prologues. Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, prologues, um, we... Um, in science fiction and fantasy, we have allowed ourselves the prologue to... Um, to break all the rules, um, which is kind of a crutch for us, I'll admit. Um, but at the same time, it allows us to do some kind of nifty artistic things. Um, prologues in science fiction and fantasy establish that if it is a prologue, most of the time you are saying this happens in a different place or time or to a different character than the main ones that we are going to focus on. Um, because of that, it allows you to do some different kinds of world building and things, don't assume that you have to have a prologue. Um, but if you do want to use one, um, it can break a few of the rules. Um, the thing is, keep in mind um, that, um, that your prologue, the reader's still going to have to be hooked the same way. Um, and it actually, by adding a prologue, what it does is it makes it harder for them to get into the book. The natural effect is it's going to it's going to add another barrier to the to the learning curve, uh, and so you want to have a payoff to that that is equally that is equally useful or hopefully more useful. One of the reasons that people do prologues in science fiction fantasy is that they can then add scope. If we look at um, uh, at Eye of the World, if it just had started with Rand in the um, in the on the farm, um, well, Rand in the Two Rivers, then uh, it's not really a farm, but you know what I mean. Um, if, if you start with Rand and the Two Rivers, then you don't have a sense that this book that is, um, is 300,000 words is going to be worth its page limit. You're going to be like, well, is it all going to be in a farm? Or You, know, you read your, first, your first, first few pages and you're like, yeah, something interesting happened. Where is this going? And Dragon Mount then adds a huge scope to that that you keep in mind that helps, um, that, that helps fill out the scope of the novel. And I think it's very, that was a very important scene. In fact, uh, when Jason read, uh, um, read uh, The Way of Kings, um, Jason came to me and said, you really need one of these um, for the scope of this novel. Uh, and uh, he, we had a long discussion about it. He convinced me that I needed to add something to give an indication that this enormous book you're reading is going to have the scope that justifies the enormous length. And that's so I added a, um, I added a prologue. Although I already had a prologue, so it became a prelude. 